Um, I'm Fiona, I'm from the Centre for Design, um, which is the building kind of over there, near, next to the library, and we've just moved into a CF school. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today, or run a workshop around the circular economy. It's meant to be kind of an introduction um, to the circular economy, but very much from a design perspective, as that's my background. But I think that looking at it from a design perspective um, is a useful way of kind of communicating how we can start to think in more of a regenerative, secular way um, from whatever kind of perspective you're, you're looking at it from. Um, so it would be good, as you're all from kind of different areas, if we could just do a quick introduction. All I want is your name, what centre or school you're from, and one word that you associate with a circular economy. So if we start with you, as you're looking at me. <laughs> I was big, big stuff. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm Hashim uh, from C, and uh, I'm doing environmental water management. Yeah. And a word that you associate with the circular economy? Sorry? A word that you associate with the circular economy? Actually, I'm dealing with the environmental, as you know, it's. Uh, uh, it's uh, this essential part of the economy, uh, the water. How okay. and but water's, uh, water's a good one. Yeah. Great, thank you. I'm um, uh, from Saturn. I'm um, doing PhD in reverse logistics and it's in that dark type of reverse logistics and it's back in the second company. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm Eva from SEC. Smith from the School of Management and Green and ISO 4001 teams. Um, I associate the word potential with it. Great, good word. We come to you. Hi, I'm Becky. I'm an organised green week and I'm on some responsibilities and I associate with um, circular economy and sustainability. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm Rebecca. I work at the River Restoration Centre, part of the USEA. Um, I think I would associate leasing with circular economy. Okay, great. Um, I'm Alice, I work um, as an environment advisor for the university in Central and Turkey as part of facilities. Um, and I associate reuse. Thank you. My name is Ajahn. Um, I'm doing a PhD in Cranfield Water Science Institute. Um, yeah, my previous post uh, degree was in environmental engineering and management, so I'm interested in yeah, mostly circular environment perhaps than economy. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Jeff Simons, uh, School of Management Finance, and complete brand new, but this uh, might be the right word. So the word would have to be recycled, that's probably because of the low phone that was on the Great, thank you. Uh, I'm John Pope, I'm a PhD student looking into integrated vehicle health management for motor parts aircraft systems. Um, the one way I associate with circular economy is unknowns. Because I'm the same unknowns. Okay, thank you. <coughs> um, Adele Croft, New School of Management, and my word would probably just be say things. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Janet Tomasi from CSO Design School of Management. And rather than naively, my work would probably be recycled, so I don't know much about it. Great, thanks. Well, I'm so sorry. Right, thank you. Good time. Perhaps we can ask you a friend. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is uh, Farid Ali. I'm from the School of Aerospace, Transport and Manufacturing. I am in the final phase of my engineering doctorate uh, in aerospace propulsion. Um, my interest has just begun in circular economy maybe five, ten minutes ago. <laughs> and uh, I would say I would associate it with, uh, uh, you know, really looking for true value for your uh, design uh, service or, uh, or uh, for your process um, in, in organization. So it's really about creating true value for your, for your business, I would say. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Sarah Ali, I'm a PhD student 
Great, thank you. Well, that's a really useful mix of words and hopefully I'll touch on many of those words kind of through the um, session. Um, this session is going to be interactive and hopefully at quite a quick pace so that we get through it all in an hour because the nature of this workshop can sort of take longer so we'll try and kind of stick to time and, and uh, go through it quickly. Um, so the impact of design um, or the impact that design has on the environment is nothing new. Um, it was like in the 1970s that um, design authors started recognising that design and the design of things and the design of stuff has a significant impact on the environment. And this picture is taken from uh, River Sitaram in Indonesia, um, and it's one of the most polluted rivers in the world, and has over a million um, people pop that populate the uh, banks of the river. Um, so it's very sort of deep, densely populated. And can anyone see from this picture what this, this boy is collecting from the stream, or from the river? No, it's straws. Yeah, so it's plastic straws. Um, and I, I, I like to use this picture because it's all very well as talking about the environment and how, okay, we should stop designing so many plastic things or we should cut down. But actually, when, we, when we're talking about design and the impact that design has, we really need to do it at a whole systems level. So any decisions that we're making are ultimately going to have an impact on whether it's our, our business or whether it's the community or even on a, on a global scale. So if we stop designing, so some of these people, even though to us that, that picture is, is horrendous, actually people are making a living um, from that. But I think these facts are quite sort of astounding that it's been estimated that 80% of products consumed are thrown away after a single use. And when you start thinking about what types of projects, products like plastic straws, um, like a lot of the products we associate with packaging, food packaging in particular, it soon mounts up. A lot of the, the products that we come into contact with in our daily lives are thrown away after a single use or um, are thrown away quite quickly, say within six months after using them. So a lot of personal care products, for example, are thrown away um, relatively quickly after we initially purchase them. Um, and there's a significant amount that designers can do, um, but there is also a significant responsibility on the early stage of product development. So it's been estimated that by the time that an artifact has actually left the design table, so once a, a, a product or a, a service has been designed and it goes then on to production, up to 80% of the economical or the environmental impacts of that product, the decisions have been made. So there's very little else that people further down on the, in the production process can do. So it's essential that we really get it right very early on in, in the um, design phase, which is, is referred to as concept development. Um, the use phase of a product is also significant, and DECA have estimated that about 75% of UK consumers' carbon emissions come directly from the use of products and services, which is a, a significant amount. And also, it's, it's not just enough to, to think of a, a product and the environmental um, impact it has throughout its life cycle. We need to think about what's going to happen to that product at the end of its life and actually how that product can be used again and again and again so that it can feed into new products and, and different life cycles so that it, it isn't just disposed of. So the circular economy is something that's come about within the last four years. Um, but what it's based on isn't new. So there's been a lot of authors that have written, you might have heard of some of the the books such as Cradle to Cradle, uh, The Performance Economy, that are talking about very similar things to the circular economy. Um, but what the circular economy has done, uh, the Ellen Carpenter Foundation have kind of spearheaded um, this, is that it's packaged the communications around sustainability in a different way, and so that it's got a lot more um, energy behind it from an organisational perspective, a lot more businesses um, have bought into it. Have, have you heard of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, most of mm -hmm. you? Yeah. yeah, okay. So you know what they've, they've kind of done, they've said that they're going to focus on education and business. They've got um, the C100, Circular Economy 100, which is a goal to engage 100 organisations in the circular economy. They've got them to invest in it. And they've done quite well at um, attracting quite large organisations to invest quite heavily in this. And we'll be talking about some of the examples of 
But I just want to, to draw your attention to this diagram and explain it a bit, because this running down the middle is our current linear economy. So this is what we have been getting good at for the last 250 years, since the Industrial Revolution. We have been um, taking raw materials, uh, developing it into products, manufacturing, delivering those to the end user, and then disposing of them. So this down the middle is, is very much our current linear economy. And then these loops around the outside of the drawing are where the opportunity is. So at the moment, so these loops are kind of looking at how products can be maintained, how they can be reused and redistributed, how the value within our materials that, that's associated with our economy can be recaptured. And the, the right hand side of the diagram is looking at technical, so anything um, that can't be uh, decomposed back into our biological system. Um, and this side, the left hand side of the diagram, looks at the, the biological system and, and the ecological system. So, food again is a good example of how a, pro of a product that fits into both sides of this diagram. So, food that can be consumed, but then also the packaging that goes with it, the technical side of that product that can't be um, consumed and can't be decomposed. So oh, another point I wanted to make about this diagram is that the further out on the loops that you get, the more energy and resource intensive it is, the activity is. So what this diagram is suggesting is that you want to go around the kind of inner loops as much as you can before relying on the outer loops. So things like maintaining a product uses a lot um, less resource because a consumer can do it, or a user can do it, say at home, um, as, so it uses a lot less resource than, say, um, recycling bins. <coughs> so the, the further out towards the, the outside of the diagram you go, the more energy and resource intensive it is. So we're going to do an activity as part of this re uh, sorry, workshop to try and get you thinking about how we can move current products um, towards a more circular model. And as I said, this is going to be quite uh, done on quite a basic level, but hopefully so that you can begin having those deeper discussions about what moving towards a circular economy actually means. So what I want you to do in your groups, I think if... Yeah, if, yeah, if we just stick with your groups, that'll probably be enough. Um, so what I want you to do is select one, of, one member from your team to come up and choose one of these products that you'll be working with. So just to quickly go through them, we've got a box of cereal, a pair of shoes, a ball, but this can be taken to mean any kind of children's plastic toy, a chocolate, personal care item, we've got a tin of paint, we've got a reusable bag, and we've got a central heating system. There's nothing actually in this box, but... Take, I want you to take the products in their broadest sense, so don't just restrict yourself to that product. It's kind of, you know, this is chocolate of any kind. It doesn't have to be that one or, or a toy of any kind. So I want um, you to select someone to come up and choose a product for your team. And then what I want you to do is the first step of the exercise is on post-its, if you can think of all of the resources that go into the design, the manufacture, the delivery and the disposal of that product. So any resources that can, not only kind of the materials that go into it, but any of the labour, any of say the advertising, how we're communicating these products to consumers, um, so, so anything you can think of, write on post-its and stick them where, they, where you think that they appear on, on the linear, current linear economy. Does that make sense? Okay, so you'll have five or ten minutes to do that.
So he would want us to make sure that we give it to this At this point, I think we've got to go to this world of factors. Yeah, of course, it was coming from. Sorry, Rick. 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 Sorry, Rick.
looking to design for service um, and, and looking at access over ownership, for example, um, designing the reuse through manufacture, manufacture um, thinking about material recovery. And for some sectors, some of these options and tools might be applicable, but then for other sectors, they might not. So it's, it's important that we have these tools and methods available to us so that we can pick and choose and decide which is the most appropriate for the particular project that we're working on or that piece of research or that business or that business sector. So I'm going to um, give you a few examples of things that we've been doing for a long time and then things that perhaps companies are starting to do to try to move towards a more circular model. So designing to use less dematerialisation is something that's been around for a long time and companies have, have got really good at. So Grosch, for example, have redesigned their bottle several times, um, both uh, for promotion in terms of uh, how the, the user interacts with their bottle, but also to make, make the, the materials that they're reduce, um, using reduce. Um, and this also obviously has an impact on the fuel that they're using for delivery. Um, but this is, is largely incremental. Um, some other companies around, has anyone seen these, these types of of companies, so they've identified that in typical household cleaning products, 95% um, or up to 95% of that product is in fact water. So if they can supply the customer with the concentrated liquid and then we add the water when we get home, this reduces significantly the amount of fuel and energy that we've used to transport essentially water um, all around uh, the globe. And there's a number of different options. I, I wanted to give it a go, so I bought this, um, this from this company called Splotch. And what they do is they sell you kind of a bundle of, of different bottles, and they're made so that they're more robust than typical ones that you throw away, so that you can reuse them. And then what they do is they send you these refillable um, containers. So, which the, the material is, is biodegradable, so you just put um, the, the sachet into the bottle and then you add hot water um, when you get home. So you put those. Um, and I think that this is, is an interesting new model um, to look at. I guess the downside of it is that when I go and do my, my shop at Tesco or something, I can't purchase that. And so I have to then go home and do a separate transaction on the internet to remember to order those things in. So I think when it comes to the interaction with the customer, a lot of organisations perhaps aren't there yet. Um, but I think that the more alternative models to consumption are out there, the more organisations innovate, then it will become more natural to us and then this will be something that, that we get more familiar with. Um, has anyone heard of the Bloom laptop? This was a laptop that um, it, it was a research project in, in, in the States that looked at how we can design a laptop for disassembly. Um, and so this laptop was designed that actually all of the parts you could take off using relatively simple tools that you'd have at home and you could send away, say if it was your hard drive and you wanted an upgrade, you'd send away that hard drive in the envelope that they gave you and then you could get a new upgrade for your laptop from the manufacturer. So it was upgradable and also it was designed so that at the end of its life you could disassemble um, the product and send the parts back to the manufacturer. Um, unfortunately, they think that this, this idea didn't make it off the drawing board because they couldn't make the economics work. And so it's really important that in designing these products for a circular economy, we have to design them very much hand in hand with the surrounding business model. It has to make economic sense um, for it to succeed. Uh, Kingfisher are an interesting company. Obviously, they're one of the founding members of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And they're committed to, um, I think it's the committed to generating a thousand products or service innovations by 2020 um, that have circular economy principles inherently embedded within them. Um, and so one of the projects that they've been working on is they've identified that they say 35 million paintbrushes are sent to landfill each year, and this generates a significant amount of waste. Um, so they've explored. I think paintbrushes are one of those types of consumable products that actually we think, yeah, you know, you'd reuse it, but 
after you've painted with it, you try to wash it, you wrap it in clean film, and in the end you just give up and, and throw it away. Um, so they've developed a product that you can reuse the handle, but they'll set, resell the reusable brushes um, and they'll package them um, so that actually you can, once you've finished using the paintbrush, you can take off the head, put it back in the same packaging, and then send it back to Kingfisher, who will then um, industrially clean it, remanufacture it, and put it back on the shelf while you just buy replacement heads for your, um, for your paintbrushes. Um, and they've also um, investigated quite a lot in looking at how they can move from a business that essentially is mass manufacturing as many products as possible to try and get as many out the door to a, a service model where they can try and retain more loyalty of their customers if you like so that they come back again and again. So an example of this is Power Tools. They identified a fact, I think a figure that something like a power tool is, is is used for about seven minutes of its life because we all own a drill and have one in our garage because we think we need one in case in case we want to hang up a picture or something but it isn't something that we use on a regular basis so they came up with this idea that you could um, lease or rent a toolkit so say for example if you wanted to retail your bathroom at the weekend you go into the and um, you'd say i want to retail my bathroom these tiles it's four meters by four meters they would provide you with a toolkit of exactly the right amount of consumables, tiles, grout, um, adhesive, and they'd also give you a box of all of the highest quality tools that you needed, um, so that you could take that away, retail your bathroom, and then come back. Um, and this is an interesting business model because it has completely tipped the company on its head and said, okay, if we're not, if we're no longer selling products, we have to think about longevity of the product. So at the moment, they don't really care if that product breaks, as long as it's outside of its warranty. Whereas on this model, they'd have to think about, okay, so how can we maintain our power tools so that we get the most value from them? How can they be designed using perhaps modularity so that we can replace parts really easily? Um, so it, it kind of creates this sense of value, both for the customer, because they're willing, because they're, they're getting access to really high quality tools and the right tools that they need for that particular job but it's also retaining the value of that product within uh, the company. So Kingfisher are doing some quite interesting things in, in that space. Um, have you all heard of collaborative consumption or the, the sharing economy? Yeah, so this is based on the fact that we all have um, resources that we're not using. So Airbnb is a really good example of this. Airbnb um, are probably the best or the, the most successful examples of collaborative consumption um, where they, people collaborate to, um, to share rooms and to share living space that perhaps they're not using uh, with other people. So instead of perhaps <coughs> going to Travel Lodge, you'd go to Airbnb. And actually, a lot of people that have used Airbnb have found that the social benefits that they get from that experience are a lot more than they'd get in a standard hotel. So typically you're going to someone's house and you'd have that kind of social interaction. Um, quite often the locations are a lot better than you'd get with a typical hotel. So I'll play a quick video because I think it's, it's good to it explain kind of the different aspects of collaborative consumption.
potential, the sharing economy is, is also known. It's something that's really starting um, to develop, not only in the space of consumer to consumer lending, but also business to consumer. A lot of organisations are, are, are recognising this and, and facilitating the transaction between um, idling capacity and the resources that we have that we want to share with others. Um, so I think that this is kind of a, a, a key area that's going to grow significantly in the future. So what I want you to do now in your groups is think about your products that you have and think about how you could develop solutions for them, whether it is at a product level or a business level, around how you can move that product more towards a circular model. Um, and so we're gonna have uh, kind of 15 minutes to think of an idea. You might think of multiple ideas, but try and choose one and then you're going to pitch your idea as if you were an organisation trying to sell this, this new idea. Okay, does that make sense?
whole yeah. yeah. That's what I mean. That, that's how I can say that you could have this subject on a shoot. Yeah. Uh,
many levels. So the team members. So that we can reduce the number of packages and keep the same product uh, uh, trying to, co to cover it, uh, to do the packages with this with less material. And uh, that was me. There's always room, room for improvements, uh, but as long as you can uh, embed the actual design process within your new design, uh, uh, you know, configuration. Uh, if you can, you know, account for all the factors that this current design, you know, accounts for and represents the design, um, you know, it's it's good to look for more opportunities to reduce cost and you know increase the sustainability of the product. consumer sharing of the 3D printers, so you didn't have to have your own. Um, once you start to think about it, you, you could have whatever colour you wanted. You could probably have a shoe made to a sort of a software last that would fit your feet really well. And um, in terms of the disadvantage of it, of course, would be that it's quite an expensive process, so you'd have to look with the, with the designer in the shoes wouldn't be any good for that. But the uh, design then, then I guess you could also have um, a whole range of designs available to to you. Um, ladies should be speaking about this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what the real advantages are. The one thing to me you could actually probably three different handbags as well and have them precisely the same colour um, and so on and so forth. That was perhaps a facetious male thought. Um, but is there anything else on? 